Oh, yeah. Back again. What's up, everybody? It's your boy, BQ. This is your Impact Lounge TNA Impact Review. And I am back. Back on my computer. Back doing it the way I'm supposed to do it. No longer recording on my cell phone. I took it to my computer guy. And oddly enough, he kind of just took the whole thing apart in simple terms, put it back together. And, you know, we're we're fully functional again. So hopefully this is a, a good quality stream. Might be a hiccup or two. I don't know. Let's let's hope it's good. Let's hope it's quality. And we're going to talk an episode of Impact that I thought was the best one of the year. Um, I saw a lot of, you know, just going, to, I, as I say all the time, I don't watch the show as it airs. And I saw, you know, several people on Twitter talking about the production value of the show. And, you know, that's one of my, my sticking points. So I was really expecting to see a show that looked like crap. And I didn't really feel that way. I thought it actually, uh, looked pretty good. The, you know, um, Mike Gilbert also pointed this out recently. And uh, I mean, this has been a thing forever. Whether you whether you watch a show and think it looks good or thinks it looks bad, there is one thing that is true. And is that, you know, they use three or four different cameras and they all have completely different color settings, different hues, different, um, you know, contrast, whatever, with different saturation. This was the one episode that the cameras looked about 90, 95% balanced, you know, like no matter what camera they cut to the show looked consistent and that made it an easier viewer experience for me. But my eyes have already become accustomed to knowing every time they switch camera angles, the show's going to look different. And, you know, that wasn't the case this time around it. it, So it, it was pleasant for me. It was a pleasant viewing experience. I thought, um, I really thought it was the best show of the year. You know, they've they've had a couple good shows. They've had a couple decent shows. I don't know if they've had a bad one this year. I feel like I feel like I remember went reviewing one that I said I didn't like very much. It might have been the second um, Snake Eyes one, even though I was there in person. Because you you appreciate a show in person a lot more than watching on TV. Like you you're into the emotion of it, into what's going on, and you don't see it quite the same way. You know, because a lot of people had asked me when I was at Snake Eyes. Does the show feel different? Is it, is it, does it look just like impact? You know, and I said no. But now as I watched it on TV, I'm like, okay, it is more impact than I realized. But you're just, the view, viewing experience is very different. But I want to say it was that second Snake Eyes one on TV that I didn't think was, was their, their best episode. Um, to give you guys an update, I'm going to Indianapolis in a couple of weeks to the, um, uh, fucking wrestling expo. I'm trying to think what the hell that squared circle expo. Uh, it's a real big time wrestling convention. If you guys remember a couple years ago when the good brothers and I believe Heath were around or it was Brian Myers, I'm sorry, Brian Myers and Heath, they convinced, you know, the powers that be an impact to hire these guys to, to do work with them, to promote their next show. Because this, this convention is just so popping. Like, I think this is the fourth year I've been every year and it was a lot easier when I lived in Illinois because it was a three and a half hour commute. Now I'm, I, I got to fly across the country um, here from Nevada, but um, it's a big time, big time convention. I mean, they just bring uh, just, just big dogs from, from all companies and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Like the, the root, they have to keep expanding, you know, um, open opening up more rooms and everything for for more wrestlers so this was the company that you know the guys that put this together they hired for the taping that was in i want to say like cincinnati or something like that a few years ago um it was like two years ago i think and the you know the the um the outcome the the attendance was really good for that show because like this is a company that really knows what they're doing in regards to promotion and all that they run a um you know, an indie wrestling event at the show and, you know, Cardona's wrestling killer Kelly and Zaya Brookside are wrestling. And then they have a bunch of absolute nobodies on the car too, but I mean, they completely pack the place. The graphics stink, you know, but it's like, they just know what they're doing. So this is a really cool 
uh, thing that I do every year. So if you guys ever get that opportunity, like the Squared Circle Expo, Expo in Indianapolis, um, I'm always looking for an excuse to go to Indianapolis. If I could live anywhere in the world, I, I know that's like an odd thing to say. There's all these countries, all these great states. You know what I mean? Like Indianapolis is my city, man. I just, it's like the perfect city for me for for there to be a little bit of downtown, but it's like really chill too. And you don't have to worry about traffic and all that cold weather doesn't bother me. So uh, I really, I really dig it out there. My, my WNBA team is out there. So I go, you know, as, as often as I can, but I'm always looking for a good excuse for Indianapolis. So I'm very excited to be going there. Uh, before I get into this episode, I, there's a story I mentioned on Twitter. I, um, I, I ran into Kenny King recently in the uh, grocery store and, um, of course, people right away are like, "Do you ask him why he left TNA?" You know, I, I just, I, you know, I, I approach him. I said, "Hey, Kenny King, big fan." I fist bumped him. He's like, "Oh, I appreciate it." You know, left it at that. I have a good habit of running into to public figures out when I'm out and about. Uh, I've ran into Angelina Love. You know, um, when I was working in Missouri. Um, if you guys watch Love After Lockup, there's this one couple, uh, Michael and man, I cannot remember his wife's name. Ju- he calls her Juju. He's like a rapper, dude. Um, I ran a hint into him twice, once in church and once at Walmart. Um, ran into a former Clipper player that I grew up watching when I was a kid that went to UNLV. So he lives out here, you know. I have a pretty good pretty good habit of that, but it was cool um, to see Kenny King. You know, I was, I was always hoping that day would come that um, I would run into him. I was, I was fairly certain we live in the same city, <clears throat> right right outside of Vegas, so. That was cool. That was cool. So um, I want to say before I get into this episode, thank you for rocking with me. The, those of you who have kind of put up with me having to record on my cell phone the last couple of weeks, that's not the optimal way that I want to record and give content, but I'd rather do that than not upload anything to the channel at all. So thank you. Just everyone who, uh, who rock with me. My, whenever I have to do that, my numbers are always down because that's not the best listening experience. And that is what I want to give you guys. Um, so thank you once again. Sorry if anyone uh, doesn't like my Britt Baker t-shirt. You know, I know it's AEW, and I'm not the biggest AEW fan these days, but this is made by Clothesline Apparel, if you know who I'm talking about, and I love their shirt. So this is one of my favorite shirts to wear because it's just very comfortable. Um, and I've got got a couple other wrestlers, but that is, you know, that is a company I fuck with. So sorry to disappoint. I actually wish TNA would would partner with with better better apparel companies i bought when i was at hard to kill i bought a um steve macklin shirt and a killer kelly shirt and then i remember joking to my kids after i'm like oh shit i forgot i don't order from tna because if i order a shirt it's from pro wrestling tees i won't order order off shop tna or whatever they call it because i don't like the quality they use for their shirts so the macklin one is great that one that one fits fine the killer not the killer kelly but the um the MK, I think I said Killer Kelly the first time. I apologize. I meant MK Ultra. If I didn't say that, the MK Ultra shirt. Fit, oh, I fucking hate how it fits. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. And I want to wear it to Indianapolis. So I'm probably gonna just throw a jacket on the top of it and just let the MK Ultra show or something because I just I I hate how it feels. Um, so I wish I would find a better company out there to to partner with. I think they did collar and elbow for a little bit, but uh, I don't think that lasted. So. Hell of an opening here. Um, let's get into this episode. Usually I jump into it a lot quicker than this, but I, you know, kind of had to update you on a few things. Um, so yeah, this episode here I thought was the best one of the year. Just uh, again, to go back to what I said earlier, I thought the viewing experience was pretty solid. I thought um, the matches were really interesting. And, and the thing that really put this episode over the top was that they advance storylines. You know, I've been saying that the best storyline was the AJ, whatever AJ Francis is doing, because that's been only been the only story for the most part. Like we're just we've been getting since the end of Bound for Glory, you know, because they phone all those episodes and we're just getting matches. We're just getting wrestling. You know what I'm saying? And there's just just very little motivation to why these matches are getting put together. And it gives me a lot of optimism for what rebellion can be. You know, because I was worried that this sacrifice card was better than what they're going to do with Rebellion. But now I'm like a little more in- invested. And um, 
Yeah, fuck. I just, I just, I just thought it was good. I, I mean, I hope you guys agree. I saw some other people online saying that they felt that it was the best episode of the year, and I, I truly feel that it was. Now that there wasn't, there were some mis, missteps. You know, there always are. You can never, you can never put on a perfect episode. But um, really, I thought it was, it was, I thought it was extremely solid. It was a much easier watch than I feel Impact typically is. So um, I did say the viewing experience was good. I have to point out Matt Raywald's mic sounded like shit. Some people did catch it. If you didn't catch it, awesome. Um, for the most part, as long as he was talking in a decent volume, it was fine. But the minute he raised his voice, it got very distorted. Um, it's crazy that it just feels like it's always something with the guys with these guys. You know, when I pointed out a week or so ago that it's, Every Impact Plus show, every TNA Plus show that has audio issues, you know, people are very quick to be out. No, it's not every show. Like it really is. It's just that they're not always as major as what you, as what we notice for sacrifice. But there's, there is always something, you know. I listen for it. I look for it. So I, I can tell you, most of you don't look for it. Um, but yeah, as I said, the cameras were much better balanced. You know, they just didn't overdo it. They didn't try to overcorrect anything, you know, like it, just, it looked a little more natural. You could see the crowd. So that was that was pretty nice as well. It kicked off with Chris Sabin versus Mustafa Ali. And initially I had no interest in this match because I'm just not a rematch guy. And I shouldn't say I'm not a rematch guy. Like I'm not Tom Hannafin first time ever matchup necessarily. But I'm more like if these guys are going to wrestle again, I'd rather see it like a month later or something. I don't want to see it. Maybe it was a month. How long ago these guys wrestle? It was at a no surrender, right? I don't think that was a month ago, but I, I need some distance. These guys have been fighting each other in six man tags and one, just, just nonstop. You know what I mean? So when he announced this, I was just like, here we fucking go again. You know, I just didn't really want to see it, but the ma actual match happened. It was excellent. Um, it was a, a outstanding way to open impact. Like this was a, you know, an incredible X division match. And I'm really excited to see where they're going with Chris Saban and um, Alex Shelley. And I don't think I've ever said that in their careers before, because even though they're really good in the ring, they just never do anything creatively that grab that, that grabs me. And I, you know, I had been saying that this is the time to split them up or to, feud them in one way or another you can always bring them back together but they've they've become bland they were they were champions both individual champions for a really long time with not a lot of story going on um and in their respective title matches recently they are they've been the underdog you know chris saban was the one getting booed versus ali alex shelley was the one getting booed versus moose so i was really hoping they were going to lean into that and by doing this feud, you know, they, they had a segment later in the show where Alex Shelley's like, well, you guys, you know, the Grizzly Young Vets came in and he said, if you want to see if you're the best, you can wrestle the time splitters next week. Like, and then he walked away. So there's, there's, there's the dissension with him and Saban. They're doing a good job of, of, of laying the groundwork, but this is really needed because Chris Saban will start getting the stronger baby face pop again. And then you can lean into Alex Shelley's been getting booed a little bit. You know, I just think with Alex Shelley as a world champion, like he's he's a dude you would normally think is a transitional champion, but he was the third longest reigning TNA champion ever. You know, that's that's just insane. You 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 know, you think I don't know who number two is. I know, oh yeah, I do. It's Bobby Roode. So Josh Alexander, Bobby Roode, and then Alex Shelley. You know what I'm saying? And that's like crazy because there was there was Moose where we wanted him to hold the title for a long time. Um, you know, you had a guy like EC3 at one point just running the company. Like, he didn't hold it that long. Uh, you know, the Stings, the AJ Styles, the Matt, the Jeff Hardys, you know what I'm saying? Matt Hardys. Like, it's just it's crazy that Alex Shelley ended up being that number three guy. And I think fans got a little tired of it. But I really enjoyed this match. Um, Matt Raywall does something that's a little annoying to me and it's not really him. This is just, it's this weird thing that has been going on for years. Like it kind of started with JBL on like SmackDown or something. Um, Corey Graves when he was at NXT and I'm sure he's still the same way now. 
um, Don Callis when he was he was doing Impact, where you're a heel one match, and then the next match you're impartial, or you're almost like a baby face, and it it just comes off like you're playing a role, you know. Like Bobby Heenan did not switch it up match to match, you know, when when he was on color. It it just it's it's really odd to me. It, it's it's it takes away. Just because it's just not genuine. And so it takes away from the match a little bit for me because he's, you know, there's two wrestlers in TNA that he is full heel behind. It's um, Mustafa Mustafa Ali and Ash by Elegance. And I'll say probably the system as well. But other than that, he's like kind of, he's kind of down the middle. But, but those certain matches happen and he's just this full blown heel and he's, he's displaying fake outrage do this entire match towards Chris Saban, which was it just took it took away from from what I thought was a really excellent X Division title match, and then Ali cheats to win, so um, you kind of keep Chris Saban a little bit strong, you know. You know what I'm saying? Like he can't, he really shouldn't have taken a clean loss at this point. But I don't want to see this again. I don't want this. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't want this. Ali cheating to win means that. We're gonna see it again next week. I don't want to see it anymore. These these teams, all the, they've all feuded enough. I want everyone to move on at this point. Excuse me. When I'm gonna actually pause to knock this coach much better. Okay. So after this, we got Gia backstage with um, Speedball Mountain, the worst tag team name in wrestling, and Nick Nemeth. And this looked a lot better as well. They still got the shadows all over Gia because they have cameras direct. I mean, excuse me lights directly in front of her ex- instead of coming from both angles that is the way you do the lighting so that that doesn't happen but they are it is directly in front of them which is why they have shadows um but it looked a lot better so thank god because i mean these interviews have been in the dark for the most part this was the best speedball mike bailey promo he has ever done in this company i'm not gonna say ever done because i've seen him do like some new japan stuff that was really good I think it was New Japan or just Jap, just some uh, some Japanese company. I don't know. You know, I don't watch that. This was his best promo. Uh, Trent Seven and Nick Nemeth brought a lot of, brought a lot of energy, and Speedball Mike Bailey matched their energy. I'm big on on matching energy. You know, I have this issue with my daughter, where she talks really, really loud, and you know, I'll talk to her in this level and she responds yelling at me. And I'm like, shh, match my energy, like match, match the energy of those around you. Like if, if I'm speaking to you with this volume, respond to me at that volume. You know what I mean? I'm all about matching energy. So he, he just felt really natural with these guys. He showed us some personality that we have never seen from him. It, he always just comes off as I, you know, I've always, I've always, asked like does he talk like this or is he a bad actor you know but he he showed some personality here that i appreciated as a fan i thought the bow at the end was was pretty funny um but they got a little thing good little, little thing going here with these guys josh alexander's theme hits and you know this is something i discuss quite often especially when we were doing the cool factor that josh alexander's theme gets no pop and if you hear it, the crowd is very quiet, and then they gradually start clapping for him and ch- chanting "Walk and Weapon." But it's not a natural song to just be like, "Oh shit, Josh is coming out," you know. And for those of you who watch NWA, if you have any interest in NWA at all, at all the match on episode one of this season—I think it's season 17—the main event was EC3 versus Matt Cardona in a death match. And, you know, usually I don't like the garbage matches, but this was really good because um, they there was storytelling involved, too. It wasn't just, you know, hit each other for the sake of hitting the sake of hitting each other with these weapons like con versus PCO or something like that. And um, EC3, EC3, excuse me, EC3's theme is a little similar to Josh Alexander. It's a much better song, but it's kind of slow and it's majestic. It's a little plotting. And it the people don't like he's over, but he the people don't pop to it. 
you know, like you, you just kind of stand and clap. But Matt Cardona had come out before him, and it's always ready, and the place erupts. It had a really good crowd for this show, and the place completely erupts. There's this energy, and I just think you need that for your type top baby face. You know, um, you guys remember this was a heel theme song for the the North that he's, he's using. You know, so I I really thought the biggest miss opportunities when he came back from injury to challenge Alex Shelley. I just thought his, his Titan Tron or whatever you can call it these days. Just, I, I thought it should have hit with just this brand new song that we don't even know who's coming out. And then, then it shows Josh Alexander, everyone pop. Like that's what, that's what I would have done. So apparently he was unable to purchase new headgear. I was, he is cutting this promo and I'm staring at him the whole time, wondering what the hell's behind his ear until I finally realized it was his, his mouth guard because he was out there dressed to wrestle. Even though he was just there to cut a promo, he was there to wrestle. His promos are getting better. The same general message is the foundation of all of, all of them. You know, I'm, well, I was the world champion for this company. I'm the best damn wrestler in the world. The foundation is, it just doesn't change. I just want him to get away from like that a little bit. But he kind of did. You know what I mean? Even though it kind of started off with that shit, I'm like, here we fucking go again. He he went a different direction. And, you know, he had said, my goal is always the world title picture. Even if it doesn't seem like it, I'm focused on it because I'm wrestling people like Simon Gotch. And <laughs> it was kind of, a, I felt like it was a dig at him. But it, it's it was cool that he pointed that out because he's wrestling in the mid card right now. Like he's just telling you, hey, I'm I'm a main eventer, even though I'm wrestling in the mid card right now you know um it's kind of like something they should have done with rich, rich swan once upon a time where he loses the title and then he's just in the mid card and they just leave him there where josh is reminding you like hey i'm that dude but i'm wrestling simon gotch i'm wrestling alan angels because you know i got some business that I take care of here but but I, I am that dude that's supposed to be in the world title picture so i thought it was one of his better promos and then bravo uh, oleg prudius and dango come out and I said this on my last review. They they look like three teenagers, not even teenagers, uh, kids, I, I guess you should say. Not that they are kids, but you'll understand the analogy. They look like three kids that went into their grandparents' closet and just put on whatever they, they saw. There's no continuity or consistency with this group that's stable. They don't have a name. It's just like, it's like you threw three dudes together, you know? Um. And I keep saying, what is their mission? What is the, what is the mission statement with these guys? And then they kind of tease that we're going to wrestle a bunch of jobbers every week. We're going to open a wrestling school. Like they, they're saying things, but nothing is really happening on screen. So ultimately we get a match that's Oleg Prudius versus Josh Alexander. And this was a was quick and painless. I was shocked to see online how many people were upset that Oleg Prudius was essentially squashed. He did get a lot of offense in in the beginning, but I was shocked that so many people had a problem with this outcome because I don't think he's someone we care about that much. But um, I don't think TNA fans like seeing their own people squashed, and it, whether it's an outsider or from someone on the roster, I just think they they want everyone to be valuable. Now, everyone can't be at the top of the card. Some people have to be at the bottom of the card. And it's also not to say that every match should be uh, competitive like AEW does. You know, they'll put a main eventer versus someone at the bottom of the card, and it still goes 20 minutes. When I went to that collision taping, I mentioned that Ring of Honor, they had four women's Ring of Honor matches. They were all enhancement talent matches, and they all went 10, 10 plus minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I get. There has to be a place for this in the card. You know what I mean? Everything can't be competitive, but I think I, I do think TNA fans value everyone on the roster and don't want to see guys squash like that, especially in a scenario like this where, like, why these guys? These guys are taking up screen time every week. But there's no, again, there's what is what are they trying to accomplish? Like, we're just not getting that. So I, I, I don't know. But I was I was actually surprised that that many people had an issue with it. I would love to actually hear from you guys regarding that if you feel you had an, you know, if you did not like that outcome. 
Crazy Steve came out, cut a really good promo. He's a great talker. He'll be at um, the expo that I'm going to. Killer Kelly will be there. Brian Myers. Um, I'm trying to think what other, what other TNA stars are going to be there. I cannot think off the top. I think Frankie Kazarian is going to be there, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, even though he's blocked me on Twitter. You're not a real fan of Frankie Kazarian hasn't blocked you. Let me tell you that. He's blocked a lot of TNA fans. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it'll come to me, but. Killer Kelly's going to be there, which I'm stupid excited about. Um, But yeah, Crazy Steve, and I mentioned this last year, Crazy Steve has like excellent handwriting, which is weird because he can't see. But he came out, cut a a really good promo, you know, talks about I beat Joe Hendry, I beat Rhino, I'm beating this guy and this guy. I'm the only champion defending every week because now we're getting a lot of champions, whether it's Moose, Mustafa Ali, like they're in tag matches, right? So he's kind of like, hey, I'm the only guy really defending this title right now. And he's, you know, setting the groundwork for his next opponent. And guess who the fuck came out? The TNA Crutch PCO. Do you know that PCO is wrestling Khan again on this next set of tapings in a Monsters Ball match? What is the difference between a Monsters Ball match and what we just saw? Well, I mean, I kind of know the difference with Monster Ball, Monsters Ball. They'll do the, um, like the barbed wire boards and shit like that. It's like different weapons, I guess. And I, I mentioned last week when I was reviewing, no, when I did it, when I reviewed Sacrifice. Not a lot of people listen to my Sacrifice review because I released it so late. When I was a kid and they did a no DQ match, it was because the heel was intentionally getting disqualified to avoid wrestling the baby face or avoid losing to the baby face. Now, yeah, Khan did get himself intentionally disqualified, but it was because he was using weapons or whatever the hell outside the ring. They were just setting the groundwork for a garbage match that we, we knew was going to happen. You can't have a feud with PCO without a garbage match. And, um, you know, they do like a no DQ, no count out where there's the the point was to make sure there was a definitive winner. And that was the difference between doing that versus like a street fight or something like that. There's no there. The, the, the lines are are very blurred with this with with TNA. You know, they do the street fights. They do the monsters ball. No DQ, like it's almost kind of the same match. It's not so a, a no DQ match wasn't, hey, let me bring a bunch of trash cans out with me to the ring like what they did with Big Con. Um, yeah, but so PCO comes out. He's the, he's the crutch. He's the big show. He's Kane. He's um, trying to think some other crutches in wrestling that you need an opponent and you you throw this guy in. For for TNA, it was, it was Tommy Dreamer. It was... PD Williams, it was suicide, you know, like we just we just gotta insert this guy in there. PCO is over with the people. It is a gimmick that that works for a lot of people. I just think he has to be a little bit of a special attraction. And he's becoming like you know, every time there's a mystery opponent, there's a mystery partner, like the the PCO music hits, you know what I'm saying? And it just I I think it's I see that it's starting to turn a lot of people off. You just got to use him sparingly. Like he can't be on every episode. He can't answer every open challenge. Like you just, I mean, it does not work with that gimmick. Like imagine if Rosemary came out every single fucking week when she, you know, the, the darker Rosemary character, you know, like we used to, when, when T when Rosemary was part of the original decay, they were a lot darker she would wrestle every blue moon and people were really excited about it. And then when she ultimately won the the knockouts championship, people were down for it. They were like, Oh, that's fucking awesome. You, when you have a wrestler like that, they cannot wrestle every week. Like the Sue Young's in the world cannot wrestle every single week. Uh, The broken Matt Hardy's it just, that doesn't work. They started doing that with broken Matt to the point where he was standing in the ring, cutting promos with a microphone instead of doing, you know, what worked. So we're just getting too much PCO. He's already been a surprise opponent like three times this year. Then we got a really good TNA plus commercial. They don't, they haven't really done things like that in the past. So good on them for that. 
Ace Austin took on Frankie Kazarian. This was superb. This was a really fun match. They are pl- they're they're telling the story where where everyone's like basically a, uh, they're kind of doing this with Big Con too, so they you gotta be careful. But where everybody outside the ring is is or everyone who's uh, you know involved in the match who is not a non wrestler, non competitor is kind of afraid of Frankie Kazarian and what he could do, or they they have issues with him when he comes out. You know, so you could hear in Jay Chung's voice, you know, Frankie Kazarian, like she did not give it the energy she would give everything else. Dave Penzer would if he would have been Frankie Kazarian, even though Frankie Kazarian like attacked him the week before. You know what I'm saying? Um, so they, they were kind of teasing that. You, Jade knows that Frankie Kazarian is going to make her make him call, make her call him the king. I wonder if they're how much they're going to lean into it because he's getting heat. He's getting booed like he. He's so good at what he does that this isn't like one of those good heels where everyone's cheering him. So he could probably take it over the top if he wanted to and wear a crown and just be ridiculous. And it, it'll work. Like he's he's making everything work. Uh, Tom Hannafin did let us know this was our first time of her matchup because we're doing that again. Um, and but But that said, it was a really good match. I love the finish. The finish was one of my favorite finishes they have done that I can't even remember where Ace Austin went for a bridge and, and just like smooth the flow of water, man. Frankie Kazarian just puts him in the chicken wing and taps him out. When you do shit like that, it makes your winner look strong and it makes the loser not look weak. You know, like he took an L. They just lost the titles, but we don't think, okay, Ace Austin's getting buried. Because the story was just that, Austin, you know, it was a competitive match, but Ace Austin just had a misstep. He just, you know, he went for something. He took a chance. It didn't work, and he lost the match because of it. It's telling the story of, like, hey, if it didn't go that way, maybe he would have pinned him here. He could have beat him. It could have gone either way. So just it was it was just smooth. It was beautiful. Loved it, loved it. Speaking of loved it, they did the system. The system had this video package promo vignette after, and it was so well produced. It looked excellent. The music fit for once. This fucking company that is obsessed with putting music behind words. And, you know, a lot of the times it doesn't fit. It doesn't, you know, fit the vibe. It takes away from the emotion of the angle. Like that's the the number one reason I don't like them doing music is because it, it, it attracts the the not attracts it um detracts the emotion from the promo and if you guys um i caught it on facebook the interview mercedes monet did with renee and i'm watching it and i'm like oh, this is kind of what i've always wanted from tna to just present rest i always say present wrestling different um, it was an interview, just the camera angles were different, just the overall production of it was so good. But it's it wasn't it wasn't complicated, you know. This kind of reminded me of that. It was so professionally done. And they're running a they're running down their accolades. And it tells a story at the same time. And Moose, you know, we've always we've we've heard Moose's accolades from Josh Matthews, who run him down every single time. Seven years in the NFL. But Moose is, is getting into detail. He's like, I played with the best quarterback. I played with the best coach. Like, he is putting himself at the end of this above everyone else on the roster. But Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards, they going through their accolades, and that also elevated him, put him above everybody else. Brian Myers said, I won tag team gold in front of 80,000 people. You know, Eddie Edwards talking about first time GHC champion. You know, like Eddie came off like, yo, how much time we got, you know? And they're just running down their accolades. And it was, oh, my God, this was so good. It's it's funny because when Moose could cut off the promo, he's like, no one can match what the four of us have done. But then, you know, of course, Alicia Edwards said nothing because she hasn't done anything. She has won, I think, three matches in TNA, uh, maybe four. And I know exactly which ones they are. She beat Rebel in a... Uh, it was either a Twitch or an Impact Plus show that they did. I think they did it in New York. She beat Rebel. She won a squash match on BTI. 
It's, it's four wins. She won a, a squash match on Impact because they had to heat her up for one week um, so that she could lose to Jody Threat the next week. And then she she won the uh, the gauntlet. So those are her four wins. I don't even think she won in knockouts knockdown when even when she even though she got like the contract. I don't think she won. I could I could be wrong on that. I'm fairly certain she was on the one on the loser team. But that's it. That is that is those are her victories. So she had absolutely nothing to run down. I don't think she's going to be a knockouts champion. I know Moose said on Twitter she would be, but I don't think she's going to going to wrestle a whole lot. Um then we got what do we get next? AJ versus Joe Hendry, AJ Francis. I love I love everything AJ Francis is doing. I know Mike Gilbert is not dead, but he's rolling around in his grave when I say that. I really I, I'm into everything he has done. And, you know, the in ring doesn't bother me because I really like the promos and he's been involved in a story since he's he's been there. And he actually comes off like a star. Like if you put him in the WWE environment, like he's a people kind of feel like he's a joke or whatever, but I feel like in this environment he really comes off like a star. He has more money than anyone on the roster, maybe not named Moose. You know what I'm saying? So um, he comes he comes off like a big deal. I thought the Joe Hendry promo was unnecessary, though. The reason I say that is because it was very refreshing last week where, when Joe Hendry came in really angry and he was fired up and he wanted AJ Francis in that ring. You know, he he's we haven't seen that side of him. It's always joking and, you know, singing songs. But he comes out, and if I were, you know, I would have told a story where he just, this motherfucker just beeline for the ring and wanted to start the match. But instead, he gets in there, he grabs the mic, talking about 200 whatever pounds of pure motivation. It was unnecessary. Very unnecessary. Like, it just, it just, it took all the emotion that I felt was invested into this feud going up to it. The match is what it was. We knew, we knew what it was going to be. At one point, the ref gets knocked out. He goes for the chair. Rich Swan comes in and steps on the chair, picks it up. And Rich Swan didn't milk it like, you know, like Shayna Wayne or something or some of these. Usually when there's like these heel turn, it's like, should I, should I, should I? And then, then he turned. He didn't really milk it like that. He milked it just enough to be like, whoa, was he? Yep. And then boom, there it is. Hits Joe Hendry. I was so impressed with the way that Rich Swan came off so naturally. It was like a completely different person. His facial expressions, just the way he carried himself. You know, it, was, it wasn't it was like, you know, the Young Bucks where it's like they're obviously playing a role as a heel, but you don't buy it. Like, I bought it. I felt it. And I'm really looking forward to where it goes with AJ Francis and Rich Swan as a heel. Rich Swan is very comparable to Eddie Edwards where they're, you know, you let him get stale for way too long. I don't think Rich Swan has ever been stale, but Rich Swan, there's been different points in his career in the last, since he's, since he won the title. I'm not even saying after he lost it, since he won it, where he probably needed some kind of update within his presentation. Um, when he teamed with Sammy Callahan for a little bit, it was doing like the OVE thing. I thought that was, that was a nice touch, but He's needed an update in his presentation for a while. And I compare him to Eddie Edwards because that's been the problem with him in the past. But they always wait too long to do it. And I don't want to say they waited too long for Rich Swan because I don't think it would have hit like this had he, you know, gone through various changes. So I'm I'm looking forward to this. I I I love this. Then we got the sound check, which I've I have mentioned I like very much. It was funny when the concierge or whatever he's he's called, Iceman, said, you know, this is where what the email stated. Like they come just completely, you know, um, flambo. Uh, I'm sorry, I was going to say flamboasted, but that's a that is also a made up word, but that's not the correct word. Be fumbled um, at what the that's also a made up word though, but just be fumbled at the <laughs> at the setting there. And Alan Angel said that he spent his whole life savings on it. I'm I'm always entertained by these. They don't take forever. You know, I think they're just well it's more entertaining to me than the Madison Rain stuff and 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 other interview segments they've tried to do backstage. 
I think that it's um I just like Alan Angels. I, I was a fan of him in AEW back when I was like really watching that company because the Dark Order is my favorite stable in wrestling. I know a lot of people didn't like them. I love them when they were like a full fledged heel group and then they turned to the joke that they are today. But um, you know, he was part of that. He got a lot of experience at doing be, being the elite on YouTube. So I mean, this stuff comes really natural for him. And you know, he was so they said they were going to give, you know, that Ash was going to make a big announcement and, and uh, Alan was so, so jazzed to have the scoop. And then she makes the announcement that she's going to have her third ever match. And he, the way he was like, <laughs> the face he made, cause he was like holding on to her every word. And it's kind of like, that was it, you know, but um, I've appreciated that with Ash, they've done it three different ways. So she's had the three matches. The first time was with Jim Miller. One time Iceman came out to the, you know, he was in the entrance way. And then they do it on Allen Angels here. So it's not like the same, same, same every single week. And, you know, I pointed out the first time they did it with Jim Miller. I didn't, I didn't like it because that's the worst produced segment on the show is the Jim Miller stuff. And I just wanted Ash away from that. It's so funny that the Allen Angel stuff is supposed to be the worst produced segment on the show, but it looks better than Jim Miller's interviews. So um, I don't know. Iceman follows me on Twitter now and he saw my tweet and he acknowledged it. So maybe um, maybe they took that advice like, hey, let's get it, get her away from the G Miller stuff um, and find different ways to make these these phony big announcements. But, um, you know, who knows? You know who else recently followed me on Twitter? Gail Kim. Gail Kim. So this guy over here who's just negative and making shit up and sees and hear things that no one else sees and cares too much about these little details. I sure got a lot of people from the company fucking following me for someone who's as bad, you know, that's that bad at what he does. Feel me. Eric Bischoff, one of my wrestling heroes, my, my heroes, you know, that's why people don't like me and don't agree with, with what I say. My heroes, Eric Bischoff fucking, you know, post TNA, of course, Eric Bischoff, um, Vince Russo, Jim Cornette, Disco Inferno, you know what I mean? These are my my wrestling heroes, my podcasting heroes. Um, and Eric Bischoff had recently said that, you know, he was talking about the the presentation of AEW, like they changed their colors and their set and all that stuff. And he he got into the present, you know, the the importance of good presentation on television. And you know, he said something that I've said many times that if you can't do the little things right, how can you ever do the big things right? Someone, I had a um, a colleague in the military. I remember exactly where it was. He was my roommate in Iraq. We were um, in our bunks next to each other. And he, w- he was someone who was known for correcting very minute details on the troops. You know, because, you know, for those of you who don't, like, really understand, when it comes to the discipline of the military, like, there's a certain way you're supposed to wear your uniform. Like, you have to wear your hat a certain way. You have to to button things a certain way. They, things can only be so long. They can only be so short. Like the, every, everything has an exact way that it needs to be worn. And there's, there's leniency. I mean, like no one's a total stickler on it. Like for instance, I shave my head. I've always shaved my head. I'm not actually allowed to shave my head because I'm not balding, but I don't look unprofessional. So no one's ever really said anything. Like it's supposed to have like a tapered appearance, but I can get away with it. You know what I mean? So it's not, you're not total, there's not, people are not totally total sticklers about this stuff, but I had a buddy who kind of was, and he's, he's like, I do that to see how they're going to react, how they're going to respond. Because if they can't do those little things, like I know that I cannot task them to do something bigger in the future. You know what I'm saying? So um, I just, I just felt that was interesting. And that was something I've always, that's always kind of stuck with me. Like you just, you have to do the little stuff. That's what, you know, the little stuff snowballs into much bigger issues. Um, so then we got Spitfire versus two job girls. I had more interest in the jobbers than I did in, in Spitfire. It's going to take me a little while to come around on them. I, I really was genuinely, I, I very few times in wrestling get very genuinely upset at an outcome. I was, I was genuinely pissed off when they won the titles. Like, <laughs> I just I think so highly of MK Ultra. But this was the only way that they could justify the three teams fighting each other at fucking rebellion. 
And then they're going to run into the same issue they always do where they just run out of challengers. With that being said, I thought that Spitfire as a team and the tandem moves, the finisher, I thought they looked really good. It, it won me over a little bit. Like they're they're getting there with me. You know, three weeks ago I was calling them Jobby Threat and Danny Luza. And now they're the tag team champions. So I can't, you know, I, I've got to start trying to look at them through different eyes and um, you know, not judge them on how they've been like previously booked. Like they were making a big deal when Jan- Danny Luna won her first match. I mean, and now they're the tag team champions. Jody Threat, what's your favorite Jody Threat match? You know what I'm saying? Like the only person she's ever beat is Alicia Edwards like three times and then a couple job girls, you know? So that's why I was just, I was, I was just like genuinely upset about it. But, you know, this was just an excuse because they brought MK ultra out. They brought um, decay out and they're obviously going to do a three-way match. And then I don't know where they're going to go from there. You know, the thing is with, with women's independent wrestler, there's, there are options out there. There's a lot of girls they can bring in. You know, NWA has a women's tag team division and it's they make it work. Like it doesn't feel it's because all the all the women are kind of paired with each other in one way or another. They can bring they they're partnered with a lot of independent promotions. You know, they they're doing like the territory system. So they're able to bring people in. And it's not that difficult with the ladies because they're not highly featured on the show. So you, you can't really justify salaries for anyone outside of like Jordan grace, your Rosemary's one. There's one or two people I'm sure are salaried, right? You can bring in independent girls, pay their independent rate. And it's not, it's not breaking the bank. Like you could double the size of the division. If you wanted to, it's going to cost you maybe a couple thousand more bucks a month. You know what I'm saying? So, um, there's women out there, you know, like if you look at women of wrestling, their whole, they've got a whole roster of women and they they know how to keep it fresh. Now, a couple of years ago, pre pandemic, they were partnering with, I don't say partnering, but they had girls from, from impact, from AEW, you know, like people were doing double duty. If you look at women, res, women of wrestling now, you don't really know any of the names. They have Santana Garrett at the top who I would, sign yesterday and they got like hollyhood Haley j but like for the most part you don't know the wrestlers they they really plucked off the indies of obscurity to create this roster so you can do it it's there you can still bring the hex in um i i, I would imagine a renegade twins are not under contract with ring of honor they might be you know like there there's there are some teams out there um I don't think they have a good relationship with the NWA anymore. They don't have a good relationship, but Billy Corgan was saying that the guys at TNA just want to do them. They weren't really interested in partnering any further, but if you were able to get like pretty empowered in there, you know, like there, there's some things you can do with this tag team division, but they need help ASAP. They need to beef this thing up. But the, the potential is out there. There is, there are women out there because there's so few roster spots overall in women's wrestling, but there's girls you can bring in off the indies that they don't have to be at the top of the card, but you can, you can beef up the division without spending a lot of money. Tasha Steeles comes out after this, to challenge Jordan grace. You know, I thought, okay, cool. They're going to build a little something here. No, we're getting the match next week. But at the same time, we know we're getting Ash versus Jordan at, at uh, rebellion. Like that's, that just goes without saying we, we already know what it is. There is a, a TNA style of booking that they do not get away from. It's it's someone coming in, winning two matches, and but because of where they came from, they're you know automatically the number one contender. So Ash by Elegance is probably going to be her third job girl next week, and then she's going to be a number one contender for the Knockouts Championship, which I think she will probably win because it makes just it just makes no sense. Look, who the fuck is Jordan Grace going to fight at this point? You know what I mean? So. Um, I think Ash is going to win, but they just they just have a habit. They can't help themselves. Um, there's just no slow build to a title match. And maybe maybe it's just the format of the show. They have four shows a month. They they choose to do an Impact Plus show every other month. I mean, every month. But they choose to, defi- the, to defend every single fucking title every time when you can do 
you know, number one contender matches and you can, you can like further the story, but they don't do that. They just keep, they have to give you so many title matches. I just, which I, I'll just never agree with. And then you, you know, you run into this issue where everything just feels so fast. So, um, yeah, we're getting Tasha Steele's getting another title shot despite losing the other day. I know she wasn't pinned, but she lost. Uh, she still only won one match this year. Keep in mind. And then we're getting the uh, the main event. We got the main event here, which was the Rascals and Steve Macklin versus Speedball Mountain and Nick Nick Nemeth. And there's Spooky the Cat making his appearance on the show. Um, drinking out of my best mom ever coffee mug. They are breaking up Macklin and the Rascals here, and and part of me is happy about that because if you caught my rant a couple weeks ago they the rascals have been coming out wearing a, a military style pattern and trying to carry themselves like fake you know fake soldiers fake troops whatever you want to call them and it upset me um spooky yawning i'm not that boring spooky luke okay um it upset me greatly because i take my service very seriously i've missed a lot of holidays um i've lost people i've worked with you know i mentioned i, I lost my spouse in 2012 um I, ju I just i take it so serious you know and these guys coming out goofy fucking salutes and standing at attention with goofy looks on their face and it, it genuinely pissed me off and i i don't care that it's wrestling because I just I respect the people I've like served next to and work with too much for to see that kind of shit on TV. And and I say the same thing if I'm watching a movie, you know what I mean? Like movie always movies always have really poor depictions on what the military is really like. And, it, and they upset me as well. So I'm kind of glad they're breaking them off from this. But it's weird because they it, they're they're forming a lot of trios in the company if you're if you're paying attention. Even Oleg and Dango and Bravo's wrestling three-way matches, you know what I mean? Or six-man matches. So I don't know why they broke him up. If it's because Macklin, I hope it's not because Macklin's leaving the company. That's where I'm, that is a possibility. I hope that's not what it is. I hope it's just that they're going to bring Myron Reed in as the third rascal and boom, there's your trio. You know, that's where I'm, I'm hoping because you know, when they, you notice when they split up um, up during the match and Macklin accidentally took out Trey Miguel, Wentz said, hey, that's my brother. So it makes sense storyline-wise for them to say, you know what, we can only trust our brothers. Maybe they bring in Myron Reed full-time. That is that is what I hope happens. But overall, this was a really good match. And then Speedball Mountain and Nick Nimeth won. We knew they were going to win. The Rascals have taken L's nonstop. Macklin has taken L's, L's nonstop. So we knew we knew where this was going and then the system comes out at the end and i they you know they continue to build angles with post match beatdowns i don't know i know there was the the hard to kill run in with nick nemeth and and um and moose but at the same time like that was months ago nick nemeth's been feuding with steve macklin this entire time i I just don't really understand why that maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's a, a something in this story I'm missing to where Moose and Speedball Mount, or excuse me, Moose and the system came out and, and attacked these guys after the match. This, of course, made them all number one contenders. Speedball Mountain has won one match this year. Uh, they won this match, obviously, but I'm talking as a tandem. They've won one exactly one match. Nick Nemeth has won three matches. He he beat these guys one by one, the Rascals and and uh, Steve Macklin and Nick Nemitz said the right things when he got to the company and like, I'm going to work my way up to the world title. We all knew he was going to wrestle the champion of rebellion. Like we, we knew that was going to happen. It's like when Nick Aldis showed up, like we just know the TNA booking at this point, but just no one ever works up to their title match. Like even when Mickey James, I, I pointed this out before when she's like the last rodeo, I'm going to, wrestle all the knockouts and work my way up the ladder. She wrestled like three of them and got a world title shot. He's like Taylor wild and Tasha steals and someone else. And then boom, you know, 
number one contender. So they just they you know Nick Nimith acted like, hey, I'm gonna feud with all these dudes. Like he had one feud and now he's the number one contender. So um, we knew that's what it was gonna be. Speedball Mountain, uh, they're just number one contenders. Like they just by default, I guess you know. So, but it should still be a good match. And I thought that you know the promo did earlier, the video package did so much to elevate Moose to elevate the system as a whole that um, I think they're really going to be really good headliners for the pay-per-view. So, um, you know, rebellion should be fun, but this was, I was really, really happy with the episode. I just thought, I, I really thought from top to bottom, it was formatted. Well, it was a pretty easy watch. Again, the, the cameras were balanced, you know, Jim Miller wasn't talking in the dark, you know, like it, it just, it was good. I thought, you know, I think the, um, I, I always talk about the slow mo videos packages in the beginning going too long. Excuse me. Um, I guess I understand after it's a, after a pay per view or after a TNA Plus show, like you feel the need to wrap up what happened. So I get it, but um, you know it lasts three four minutes and then they play the intro and it's just it just takes too long for the episode to start. That's always kind of been my issue. Um. I think that's going to do it for me, guys. Uh, I went I ran about you know, 10, 11 minutes over, more than I normally do. But I just you know, really wanted to reiterate that this was a great episode. And I'm hoping next week is just as good. I hope it's not like a Windsor thing, like the energy that Windsor brings. You know, when they move on to the next city, hopefully it doesn't. You know, I think it's uh, Philadelphia or something like that. Hopefully it doesn't completely turn to shit again. You know, well, I'm not not turned to shit, but I just mean I hope I hope it's just not a roller coaster. Like I just I just just wanted to stay upwards motion. You know, so that's gonna do it for me. I am your boy BQ. Thanks for rocking with me once again. I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. <laughs>